subset of those sort of paths. So now if you have horizontal, well, then it's one skin number. But if you have that, that number, if you just have vertical down steps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That I didn't specifically yeah. look at. Yeah. Yeah. For, for all this stuff, I'm only looking at subsets of those paths and then kind of count those. So. Yeah, not relevant for this, basically. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. So now, as an example, uh, so if I take the permutation 312, uh, obviously it contains exactly one copy of the pattern in 312. Uh, this corresponds to this path right here. And the downward steps here correspond to uh, entries in the terms in the permutation. So in a sense, this step here represents the 3, this re represents the 1, this represents the 2. And then these, these downward down jumps, these vertical steps, uh, represent kind of the middle of these 312 patterns, in a sense. Uh, I'm confused. Ex could you explain again, how is this 312? What's the connection with 312? You said you go up, up three steps? Uh, so the, there's, a, there's an additional thing you have to map the permutation to, and then that gets translated to the path. So, yeah, so it's not a, from, from the permutation, it's not an obvious <laughs> mapping. Um, if I didn't risk failing my defense by going over time, I would show it, but <laughs> for the purposes of this talk, <laughs> I'm treating it just as a black box, unfortunately. Um, all right, so you have this permutation. And uh, the idea is that you can extract a relevant subpath uh, shown in the red box. And uh, basically, Fulmec shows that, so pretty much any path that contains this subpath, right, that's a generalized dig path, it contains this subpath, uh, and also does not contain any other down jumps anywhere, those all correspond to the permutations you want, like permutations of one copy of 312. So the idea is then, I want to count sort of these generalized dig pads with this subpath and no additional down jumps anywhere else. And all of those paths will correspond to the permutations I'm interested in. And just to kind of give a sampling of what the approach looks like, uh, basically I add weight, a kind of add weights to each step. So I imagine the up steps and the down steps to be weights of square root of x downward jumps to be uh, weight 1, and then T is the relevant subpath that I need to contain. Uh, P1 and P2 just represent some partial big pads with no jumps that terminate at that end at height 0. The weight of T will be, uh, I have 5 up and down steps in the uh, subpath T along with one down jump, so I have x raised to five halves. And also the weight of all possible uh, sort of the partial paths, p1, p2, uh, will be this expression here, where L is the starting height of the subpath, and C is the generating function for the Cadillac numbers. And basically you can toss everything together uh, to find the generating function you want. Like the F1 generating function by combining all these weights. And then you know, this collapses down to this expression here, where C is a generating function for the Catalan numbers. So, so this is uh, part of what Fulmec did in his work. Uh, likewise, uh, if you want length 2 permutation, so if you, sorry, if you want to consider two copies of the pattern 312, the idea is that first you consider sort of these base permutations. So in a sense, if you imagine a length n permutation that contains two copies of 312, take the terms that, course, that are part of the copy, strip them out of the permutation, then apply the reduction to that. And in a sense, those permutations are sort of the base permutations. So, Essentially, the base permutations represent kind of structurally how your 312 patterns can occur within your permutation, roughly speaking. And so the idea is that for each of these, you kind of consider the corresponding subpaths 
you find the generating functions for each one, then you add up the generating functions to get the one you desire for F2. Uh, now the nice thing about this, in a sense, translating them into paths is that uh, there's a, by using this paths approach, there's a nice way to find the generating functions. And also it reduces down the number of cases you have to consider as well. So just to kind of give an idea of what this looks like, for example, the base permutation 3412. So this, this is how, this is one way that you can have two copies of 312 in your permutation. Right? Right? You get <coughs> this corresponding path here. The relevant subpath for that will be the, this portion in red. And then you play the same game as before, that you want to count all the generalized dick paths with this subpath, right, but also with no other down jumps anywhere else. And then by piecing together generating from the generating function like before, right, you get this expression here. Aren't you supposed to have two vertical <coughs> jumps? Because yeah, so that two, three, one, <coughs> Yeah, so that's kind of one of the subtleties. Uh, so it doesn't exactly translate that way. So the number of down jumps doesn't necessarily directly translate to the number of occurrences. All right, so in a sense, this kind of represents the three and the four, the one and the two. All right. <coughs> Likewise, <coughs> it's possible you may have, in a sense, two disjoint three, one, two patterns. And so, in terms of the path, you may end up with two copies of this 312 subpath right, connected with some other partial paths. And so, one example here is <coughs> the permutation 316452. Uh, the path for this permutation is, exact, is exactly this. And this is one specific case of, for example, uh, this. Right, this thing here. So basically, instead of counting, right, so basically you can come over here and kind of with generating functions count all the ways that this sort of thing can, this sort of structure can occur in your paths. <coughs> right, and then so by doing that for all the different pieces and combining all the generating functions, right, you can find the uh, F2 generating function. And so this Fulmec did in his paper. But in his paper, uh, he used a lot of uh, observations, uh, you know, sort of symmetry arguments and such to reduce the number of cases he had to consider. And also, the setup, even for the, uh, the, the R equals 2 case, wasn't conducive to uh, extending it further. So in this particular work, the, the goal was to <coughs> study his approach, reformulate it in a way that can be made systematic and then program it in Maple and have Maple compute more stuff. So, <coughs> uh, so we're able to do that. And so using extending his approach, right, we can also get the uh, R equals 3 and R equals 4 cases. Um, <coughs> basically, uh, this was also discovered by Mansur and Vinchning, uh, kind of different approach. So <coughs> to some degree, uh, these generating functions for three and four, uh, they're not, as a result, they're not brand new, but these are almost the different alternate proofs for it. Uh, but more generally, uh, you know, this portion is just to show that you know, there's a lot of techniques that are done kind of by pencil paper that can be automated and you can, in a sense, using computers, push the technique further to get more rigorous theoretical results. That's the idea. Just in the last portion, <coughs> Let me just briefly mention one additional uh, case, the consecutive patterns. <coughs> so this variation of uh, the, so this is a variation from the classical pattern problem. So now I'm looking at consecutive patterns. So for a pattern to occur in a permutation, the occurrence must occur in consecutive entries, all consecutive entries. Uh, so this is. <coughs> Uh, so this variation uh, was studied, uh, basically it was made popular maybe about 10 or so years ago by El Zaldi and Noy, by one of their papers. And then since there, a lot more focus has been 
uh, given to this specific variation or the permutation pattern problem. So just as an example, if my pattern is 1, 2, 4, 3, then the permutation 1, 2, 3, 6, 5, 4, it, contain, it contains my pattern consecutively uh, because the middle four terms are 1, 2, 4, 3. <coughs> On the other hand, uh, 1, 2, 4, 5, 3 avoids this pattern consecutively. So note that in a classical sense, it contains 1, 2, 4, 3. Uh, but in terms of classical pattern occurrences, uh, this permutation avoids this pattern consecutively. So now what I'll be interested in is the analogous question. So given some pattern sigma, I want to count how many length n permutations avoid that pattern, but consecutively. <coughs> the notation's a little bit different than before. Uh, now I have the n. This is almost like a function of n. And, but most of the time, uh, in the rest of the talk, I'll drop this subscript uh, sigma. And you know, you know, sigma will be implied by the, uh, we kind of specify. Uh, the corresponding generating function for the sequence uh, is this exponential generating function, a sigma z. Uh, one comment is that uh, in the classical case, uh, we considered ordinary generating functions. Uh, in the consecutive setting, uh, most people have looked at exponential generating functions. <coughs> you know, kind of one of the reasons is that uh, consecutive patterns are much, much easier are much, much easier to avoid than uh, classical patterns. So actually, for any pattern sigma, this sequence here grows kind, almost on a factorial kind of pace. So you know, this, this sequence grows very quickly. So. And, Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so most of the time I'll leave out the sigma. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, in the consecutive case, there are more patterns to consider. For example, for length three patterns, uh, there's two cases: one, two, three, and one, three, two. So some of the trivial equivalences still apply in the consecutive case, but now, right, in the classical pattern case, these two patterns were equivalent. In the consecutive case, they're actually now different. That's one thing to note. I thought you said there were two classes <coughs> in the uh, case. What's that? I wrote down that there were two classes for framing these three. Uh, one three, one three uh, when r is strictly greater than zero. Oh. Yeah. When r is equal to zero, uh, they're, they're both counted by the Catalan numbers. So yeah, when r is equal to zero, and so for the classical case, I'm just going to only talk about the avoidance. So for the classical avoidance, yeah, both the one two three and the one three two are counted by the Catalan numbers. But here it's just uh, it's two. Okay. Uh, for length four patterns, for the avoid, you know, for the avoidance case, uh, I have seven cases to consider for consecutive patterns. For classical pattern avoidance, it was just three cases. The 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 3, 4, 2, and the 1, 3, 2, 4. So it was just three cases in the classical pattern avoidance, but now there's seven cases for length four patterns. And <coughs> there are some generating functions known. Uh, for the length three patterns, there's exponential generating functions that are known. Uh, for length four patterns, some of them are known. Uh, and even the ones that are known, a lot of times it's given as a, some differential equation that the exponential generating function satisfies, or as some other complicated recurrence. Uh, this particular approach, you know, I won't go into detail, but it's based off of what's called the uh, cluster method. Uh, so it's an extension of the cluster method by Golden Jackson. And essentially, it's a kind of a clever extension of the inclusion-exclusion principle. So I won't go into the specific details of the cluster method, 
But the idea is that using the cluster method, you can derive for any, any given pattern, you have a recurrence of this form for the alpha ends. And the main thing here is these CK terms. Uh, and these CK terms are some sort of weighted sum of clusters of the pattern. And <coughs> I won't precisely define that, but essentially a cluster of a pattern is it's some permutation that's fully covered by this pattern. It's kind of a cluster of a pattern. And so, but the bottom line is, if you can compute these CK terms, then that will determine the alpha n values. So the challenge here is computing the CK terms. And just to give an example of what one might look like, uh, for the pattern 1, 3, 2, uh, you refine this CK value based off of the last three terms of a permutation. So it looks something like this. And then you can derive some, this isn't too ugly, but the recurrences get fairly ugly. You can derive some sort of recurrence for these refined CK values. Right, so you have some initial conditions when K is less than or equal to three. And when K is larger than three, you have this sort of <coughs> recurrence for the expression. So it's not a nice thing to compute. So in this portion of the Midas my thesis work, uh, basically the goal was to teach a computer to, given any pattern sigma, to automatically uh, derive a recurrence for this sort of refined expression. Using that, compute the CK terms, and then computing the, the relevant sequence, the terms alpha n. And so uh, one thing to mention is that this approach is guaranteed to work for any pattern in this uh, consecutive case. Now, for classical patterns, you know, there is no approach that's guaranteed to work for everything. But for the consecutive case, this approach works for any pattern. And one more thing is that these recurrences can be converted to sort of ugly functional equations to also speed up the computation. So just as an example, <coughs> if the pattern is 2, 1, 4, 3, uh, you can easily compute uh, the 45th term of the sequence, which is this thing here. Uh, it's actually not that far off from 45 factorial. So, uh, Lastly, uh, this approach you're able to extract an actual rigorous result from it in this case. So basically, that if you have two patterns of the same length, and here I'm very vaguely defining self uh, overlaps, but basically if you have two patterns, and they kind of, and the patterns you have a certain kind of self overlap that's equivalent to the other one, uh, then you can show that the generating functions are equivalent. Uh, this is something that's called the consecutive wolf equivalence. Uh, this, right around the time I realized that this can be pulled out of the uh, previous approach, and another paper came out right around the same time by Pershkin and Shapiro. <laughs> so. <clears throat> and lastly, so, you know, so using this theorem and also the previous algorithm, are you also able to compute, you know, basically, classify the Wolf classes for the consecutive case up to length six patterns. There's an asterisk here because for length six patterns, uh, technically there are four specific equivalences that this approach couldn't prove, but that seemed to be true. And then that was solved last year by uh, Els, Alde, and Noy. So you know, the length six patterns are also completely classified now. And so uh, that's basically it. Thank you. <laughs>